Awesome. Thank you, Bonnie. Now, before we open the Lord's word, let's go to him in prayer first. All right. Dear God, thank you just once again for you are the one that I believe in. You are the one that I trust in. You are the one that I hope in. And Lord, as we dive into all the way back to Genesis chapters 4 and 5 this morning, just make that clear to us that you are the one that we can hope in, that we can trust in, and that we can believe in. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are, all that you do. And in your name I pray. Amen. This one is really, really interesting because we are going to get into what is called a genealogy. And I'll explain this later on. Uh, but for the most part, genealogies in the Bible are kind of seen as boring parts of Scripture with a bunch of names that we can't pronounce. And so therefore, we just skip it. Uh, but I think there's something there, especially in Genesis 4 and 5, that's really, really interesting. But before I start that, though, I've always been fascinated when it comes to um, just family lines. One thing that I love that my grandmother did for, for us kids was um, that she would spend time and she had this whole project where she tried to trace our family line and actually went back. Uh, we are actually related to Dolly Ma Madison, the wife of James Madison, uh, our, uh, one of our presidents, which is awesome. And uh, William the Conqueror, I think, was in there as well. And, uh, and so basically, if I do ever decide to run for office, I have some sort of family background in it. <laughs> but promise, I promise, I won't, because uh, there's a little bit too much stress in that job. So, but with that being said, I love the family background because it shows you um, where your family has been, where it is now, and then the, just the excitement of where it can go from there. Genesis 4 and 5 are kind of the same, and it starts out that way, but then something tragic happens instead. So, main idea of Genesis 4 and 5 is this. Since we are all born of the seed of the woman, or the seed of the serpent in a spiritual sense, let us run to Jesus, the one prophesied, who ends eternal death and grants eternal life. So we turn to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read. Now, Adam knew his Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I could bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anybody kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. 
Then Cain, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehuhael, and Mehuhael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two, we- two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabel, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal, of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. So if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, that's a lot to think about, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, which is even more a lot to think about, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared, which is a normal name, had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed... This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And after Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The idea of all these names, some very interesting, and then some, thankfully, pretty normal, um, are helpful to see when it comes to this idea of being part of the seed of the serpent or being part of the seed of the woman. And we'll break those down. So first off, I see four main points that go into this main idea this morning. First, Seeing that the promise of enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman came uh, coming to fruition right away with devastating outcomes. 
Do not hesitate to decide whom you will follow, trust, and serve. And we see that in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Second is this. Even though the seed of the serpent remains and continues, rest in the fact that there will be consequences for the seed of the serpents. We see that in verses, in verses 17 through 24 of chapter 4. Third, even though the seed of the woman seems small at first, cherish the fact that God has grafted in every single member of this family. And we see that in chapter 4, verse 25, all the way through chapter 5 of Genesis. And then last is this. Seeing that the promise of Genesis 3.15 has come to fruition through Jesus, come to the cross today to be adopted into the seed of the woman. And we see that in Matthew 1, verses 1 through 16, which we'll get into later on. So starting with, seeing that the promise of imagery between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, seeing that come to fruition right away, again, with devastating outcomes, do not hesitate to decide whom you will follow, trust, and serve. You see in verse 1, even after being thrown out of the Garden of Eden, it is important and encouraging to see the faith of Adam and Eve in trusting in the prolegomena or the promise in Genesis 3.15. So turn with me there. Genesis 3.15. And this is God speaking not to Eve, but to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And But we see this promise being faithfully looked for by Adam and Eve in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I've gone to man with the help of the Lord. This is basically, look, I have finally, I've gotten a son to continue this idea about my seed eventually stopping that crazy serpent that has driven us out of the garden of Eden and away from the presence of God, it seems like at times. And I finally gotten a son and she's so excited about it. But not only that, but she gives birth to another son in verse 2. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. It's interesting that Abel's name isn't given a, really given a description with it. Like, in verse 1, Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord, but there's nothing there for Abel. It kind of leaves you almost wondering what his name means. Well, it's this. It's actually, the Hebrew word for the name Abel actually relates very closely to the Hebrew word that we saw in Ecclesiastes 1 that translates to breath. The last time that we walked through scripture, we were in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, looking at after everything that we have, all the temporary things that sometimes even may seem meaningless, but they have a purpose, but they're temporary. The only thing that's eternal is the word of God. And so that's what we should trust in. And, and it's cool to see that Abel is this, this life-giving breath that is there for Adam and Eve. But it's interesting also because the life of Abel was so short-lived. Now, their names could also bring to light why God became so pleased and displeased with Abel and Cain's offerings, respectively, which we're going to get into here. Cain and Abel brought offerings to the Lord at the same time in the area of expertise that they were in. But there is a big difference between the description of Cain's offering and Abel's in verses 3 through 5. You see, Cain just brought an offering of the field, but Abel's offering was described as the firstborn. The firstborn, the reason why that is so important is, God, I am bringing my first to you. 
I hope that I have more after, but even if I don't, I'm willing to bring my first to you. Even if nothing comes after, I'm bringing this to you to trust in you that you will provide from here on out. And that's exactly what Abel's doing. But Cain is just bringing an offering of grain to the Lord. It's not the firstborn. It's not the, the first harvested. There's not a ton of trust there. It's just, well, I guess I got to bring this because my brother's bringing something. Don't get me wrong. I have a younger brother, so I understand. But this difference shows the respect that each man had for the Lord and what it meant to be God's child. Abel saw it as a privilege. Cain saw it as just kind of something he had to do. And you see, just like with his father, the Lord gives Cain a very simple question to answer, but Cain stays silent, whereas Adam just kind of made excuses. And you see, that silence is the sin of hatred that is preying upon Cain's heart. In verses 6 and 7, let's read this. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. In, in some ways, sin doesn't appear to be dangerous at first, it's just waiting. It's just taking its time until it can take full hold and, and do the damage that it does to you and I. With that, even after taking the first human life on earth, God still, he still gives Cain grace to come clean with a simple question, but is met with sarcasm and spite instead. Therefore, the Lord responds with discipline. So what is the seed of the serpent's first act? To destroy the seed of the woman. Abel dies by the hands of Cain. But it's more deeper than that. The promised child you think would have been Cain, but instead he's turning to the seed of the serpent and he's acting just with hatred. And therefore the seed of the woman you would think would be able, but then he suffers, is tortured, and dies at the hand of the serpent. Can you imagine the horror and the terror on Eve's heart? on Adam's heart. This is groundbreaking, earth-shattering. And the question about Abel should run chills down our spine as we remember God calling out to Adam after he and Eve sinned in the garden in Genesis 3. Adam, where are you? Where are you? Even though God knew exactly what he did and exactly where he was, he still asked, where are you? He wants Cain to give or he wanted Adam to give just this moment to say, okay, I messed up. And God is doing the same thing here. In verse 10, and the Lord said, what have you done? And in verse 9, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain just responds with sarcasm. Well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Don't get me wrong, being an older brother, you do kind of feel bad at times. But the ramifications of Cain's sin are devastating. But they're not life-threatening to him, as we will soon find out. Cain responds in what appears to be almost remorse but he still ventures off from the presence of God, never to return. Look at this in verses 13 through 16. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. 
I don't think he's exaggerating. He's being told that you're a fugitive, you're a wanderer on the earth. Behold, you have driven me today away from the grounds, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And at this point, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe he feels bad about what he did. Maybe. I, I could start seeing that. Then he says this, and whoever finds me will kill me. Okay. Now, now we're seeing what is on Cain's heart. It, it, it's all about him. But then the Lord said to him, not so. If anybody kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. The Lord gives him grace in this moment. So was Cain truly sorry? Yeah, at first it may seem that way with how horrified he is. However, deep down, the only thing he cares about is how this will affect himself, not how his sin has broken the heart of our Lord. And even with Cain's further showing of pride, the Lord continues to show him grace by putting this mark. But then we get to verse 16, and this is so, so sad. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. Again, how horrifying for Adam and Eve to see the son they pictured to be the promise in verse 1. Leave that promise behind and never come back. So with the blood of Abel crying out and the line of Cain soon to start, it seems that the seed of the serpent has the upper hand. But the seed of the serpent will ultimately pay for their disobedience to the Lord, which is where we turn to verses 17 through 24. So even though the sea of the serpent remains and continues, rest in the fact that there will be consequences for the seed of the serpent. You see, not only did Cain survive, but he even started a family line, which, by the way, that's one of the great questions in Scripture. Who was Cain's wife? We're not going to answer that today. All right? So... Uh, if you want to, go to Answers in Genesis. They do a great job. Uh, but we're not going to get into that this morning, all right? So, but anyways, with that, uh, not only did he survive, but he started this family line. A and at first, you're thinking, okay, so what is he getting at? Is basically all the sons of Cain are just these, like, henchmen that are evil? Actually, No. The sons of Lamech and the talents that they brought with them are actually more evidence of God's grace to Cain. And again, if you want to look at the names here, in verse, uh, verse 20, Adab bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Really, really important. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe, who love music. Zillah also bore to Cain. He was the forger of all instruments, of bronze and iron. Basically, he was, you know, a forger uh, of, you know, basically industry, and that's really important. And so even though you would think that Cain's line would just be, well, this bad guy after bad guy after bad guy after bad guy after bad guy, God actually takes Cain's line and says, even in the midst of that, what you think would happen, I'm going to show my grace. And Cain's line contributes, though, it does contribute to the wickedness that was so great that it led to a worldwide flood that only left one descendant of Seth and his family alive, which was Noah. So the sea of the serpent seems to continue on with no repercussions, but with the flood, the Lord will soon bring an end to the line of Cain while honoring the line of Seth. And so therefore we go to the line of Seth. Even though the seed of the woman seems small at first, cherish the fact that God has grafted in every single member of this family. This is awesome to see. Let's start with verse 25. 
Even in the midst of grief of losing both of their sons, Abner and Eve still don't lose faith and give birth to another son whose name is Seth. In verse 25 of chapter 4, And Abner knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And at this point, if you think about it, they've lost not one, but two sons. And so therefore, how is this promise in Genesis 3.15, which we were there and we heard, we heard the Lord say it and we trust and believe in that. How is that going to happen? Well, the Lord shows up and Seth is born. Seth is born to Adam and Eve. Seth's name itself testifies to the faith of Adam and Eve. Because you see, Seth means anointed or appointed. And it can actually mean even compensation. And so at the end of their grief, God appoints them to have an anointed one to give them relief. What a beautiful picture that is. And over the last about five, five weeks or so, um, our students and I have been walking through the book of Lamentations, which is one that is not taught on a ton, uh, and, but yet it is an incredible book to see how do we respond to grief in a godly manner. Because the writer of that book is Jeremiah, and he sees his world and his home and his town and his people burning to the ground at the hands of Babylon. And he writes this book cry out to the Lord to put his heart on the line to you and I and say, Lord, why are you doing this? By the end of the book, the last chapter, which we're going to get into this Wednesday, the last chapter is all about hope. And it's about the fact that we have a God who loves to restore. I love that. And I love that. We see that here with Seth. So not only does Seth come forth, but he has a son that leads to a line that calls upon the name of the Lord. If you want to see that here in verse 26, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Again, I, I don't know where they get these names from, but anyways. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So it's cool to see. It, it's really cool to see God's grace in the seed of the woman. Now, we're about to get into chapter 5. I want to make this crystal clear about genealogies. For the most part, genealogies are seen as boring parts of scripture that don't seem to be applicable to us since it isn't really in our family tree, where it doesn't appear that way. However, with the line of Seth, there is a lot to be seen here, especially because it leads to Christ eventually, which is where we're going to get in Matthew chapter 1. And it's interesting as well that Moses starts this genealogy with reminding us of the beginning of man from Genesis 1 and 2. I love this here. This is the book of Generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and, they, and named them man when they were created. By the way, let me read this one more time. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Why should we love our neighbor? Because we are made in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. There is just male and female. And God created them and crafted them and loved them. And he loves you. And I love to see that as he starts the genealogy. And then we get into all the numbers and the names. The lifespan of the line of Seth is fascinating to say the least. But this genealogy brings to light one sad fact though. And you might have seen this comparing the seed of the serpent or the line of Cain in chapter 4 with chapter 5. There was one big difference, and it's this. Physical death is destined 
for us all because of sin. When I was reading through all those names, how many years they lived, the saddest part of every single one is, and he died. Because that was never, ever supposed to be the case. When God created you and I, when he thought to himself, I am going to create something, this living creature in my image and in my likeness, he didn't think, and then after a short while, they'll just stop to be. No, we were always meant to never have death as part of our life. But because of sin, death is a thing. And so when you read chapter 5, it, it's interesting to say the least. Okay, how does, um, how, okay, how in the world, after 900 years, could you keep going? I mean, honestly, like that, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Oh, yeah, I've been through this before. I've got 900 years experience on this earth, all right? So, I mean, how could you in the world keep going? Like, that's fascinating to see. But the reason why the geology is here is to show you the destruction of sin in chapter 3, when sin comes, and chapter 4, when the murder of Abel happens. The destruction of that sin is even seen in the seed of the woman. So just because you and I are believers in Christ does not mean that life is rosy and that life is perfect. And it doesn't even mean that we won't die. We won't die physically. We won't die spiritually, though. We will die physically, but we won't die spiritually. Because the man who has saved us has granted us eternal life. But unlike the, Cain, the line of Cain that boasted in their sin with Lamech saying, oh, well, you know, if Cain is, did this, well, then therefore I should have even more of a chance at life after I committed a murder. But this... Unlike that, and the boasting of that, the line of Seth has men that walked with God, Enoch, and hoped for relief from the Lord through their line, which is Noah's father. And I love how he names Noah. Verse 28 of chapter 5. When, La when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord is cursed. He's not, he's not putting it any... He's not making excuses. This is what has happened. This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And we do see that come true with Noah creating this thing called an ark to save himself and his family and to begin a new line. And, and just a reminder here as well. This book was written by Moses sometime during the wilderness wandering. So as they're wandering around the wilderness, because they've been kicked out of the promised land beforehand that the country of Israel has, Moses is writing this book. And this helps to show us that Moses is encouraging the new line that will journey into the promised land to remain faithful to the Lord. And this is a reminder to you and I as well. This was a reminder to us of the difference between the line of the serpent and the line of the woman. And we're going to get to how this comes in Jesus in just a second. But it is important to see the righteous line of Seth. But here's the thing. This just seems so ancient. So why should it matter to you and I today? Why should this long ago family line with these weird names and people that live way longer than I do now, uh, why should that matter? And it's the last point. Because seeing that the promise of Genesis 3.15 has come to fruition through Jesus, the fact that he has defeated Satan. He has defeated that serpent of old. With that knowledge, come to the cross today to be adopted into the seed of the woman. 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. I want you to see something here. Matthew chapter 1. It's the genealogy of Jesus. And I love how he gets this thing started. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And again, I love how this starts. Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus from the Old Testament onward. And this was to show his mainly Jewish readers that Jesus comes from the line of Abraham and David and is the promised Messiah and the promised King and the promised Lord and our Savior. And I love to see that. Already in verse 1, and then we get the rest of the chapter. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Solomon, and Solomon the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of, of Abijah, and, the, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Joshua. Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel was, was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel was the father of Abiad, and Abiad, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliad, and Eliad, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mothan, and Mothan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. And I love this. You may be thinking to yourself again, though, what does it matter? I'm not part of this line. Well, we may not be a direct biological part of this line, but we are part of this line spiritually as followers of Jesus. If we believe in Jesus, we are deemed sons and daughters of God, making us actually part of the seed of the woman. So everything that we've talked about so far belongs to you and I because we trust and believe in Jesus. Now, I mentioned adoption as a big part of this section of Matthew chapter 1 because it relates to how we are grafted into this line. The main reason, though, that I mentioned adoption is because Jesus himself was actually adopted into this line by Joseph. You see, Jesus was the biological child of Mary, but not of Joseph, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came upon Mary. And that's what we know as the virgin birth. So how did Jesus become the son of David? Because we know that he is, and he's shown to be in Scripture that he is. Well, it's because Joseph, by adopting Jesus, proclaimed to those around him that he saw Jesus as his own flesh and blood. And the reason why I love this is because back in 2001, my family and I, well, it was more my parents. My parents made a decision that mom no longer wanted to have just boys in the house, and so therefore, that's how my little sister, um, that's how we came to adopt her from Russia. And I love this, though. Here's the cool thing that I love about adoption. The moment that Tatiana stepped foot in the United States and was deemed a McQuinn, which is my last name, the cool thing about adoption is no longer is she seen as what she was then in Russia, but now she is seen as a McQuinn. And what's cool is she actually has like 
the same eye color and the same hair color as we do. The only thing you can tell that she's basically adopted is that she's the second tallest in the family and she's always tan. Always. Which never made sense to me. But anyways, I love it because as soon as we adopted her, not only does she get our name, but she inherits the things that my mom and my dad want to pass down to us. Do you see where this is at in Scripture? This is really cool. When we come to know Jesus as Lord, we are adopted as his children, and therefore Jesus sees us as his own. Everything that was given to Jesus, the fact that he is the Lord and Savior of the world, and that he is given this opportunity to wipe the slate clean of sin and death and give us an opportunity to spend eternal life with him, we are given that as sons and daughters of the King Jesus. I love that. But it gets better. It gets better. But how can I be adopted by Jesus? Don't you know what I have done against him? Well, let us take a look at the cast of characters that are in the genealogy of Jesus. First off, the only one who was perfect in this line was Jesus himself. And because of his sacrifice, he embraces all who come to him as sons and daughters. And this is really cool. And this is where I'm going to end. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Look at the cast of characters here. You have Abraham. Well, great. Abraham was the father of so many nations. Well, yeah, but he also wanted to show a group of people that, yeah, this person, yeah, this really lovely lady right next to me, yeah, she's not my wife, she's my sister, so you can have her. And yet, he's in the line of Jesus. But it gets better. Jacob, who lied and lied and lied and deceived and deceived and deceived, when he when it comes to his brother, when it comes to his father, when it comes to his father-in-law, he's in the line of Jesus. But then it gets better. Judah sleeps with his daughter-in-law and has children by his daughter-in-law because he thought she was just a random prostitute. He's in the line of Jesus. But guess what? It gets better. Look at this. You have Rahab who's in the line of Jesus. And she was a prostitute. She's in the line of Jesus. But it gets better. Look at this. David's in the line of Jesus. Well, guess what David did? David's so such a good guy that he basically said, well, I'm on my soldiers' way, and he's got a lady that looks pretty great, so I'm going to steal her and then sleep with her, have a kid by her, and then I'm going to kill him off so then I don't get in trouble. He's in the line of Jesus. Solomon is in the line of Jesus. A dude had like a thousand wives or something like that. He's in the line of Jesus. And on and on and on it goes. And you think to yourself, I can't be a son or daughter of Jesus. That is a lie from the pits of hell. But the reason why you and I could be part of the line of Jesus isn't because of anything that we've done. It's everything that he has done. Everything. He's the only reason why I'm here today. He's the only reason why I breathe. He's the only reason why I sing. He's the only reason why I read his word. He's the only reason why I keep going, even in the midst of times where it seems like everything around me is crumbling and spiraling down. Because I know for a fact that when I believe in Jesus, there is nothing I can do to be disowned by God. Because God, God is the one 
who grafts in every single member into his family. And he does not make mistakes. So with that, the only way I can end this is by pleading to you to become part of the line of Jesus. Is to plead with you to become part of the family of Jesus. To become his son or his daughter today. And the only way that we can do that is by trusting in him as our savior. So with that, please, please bow for me and let's go to him in prayer. God, you are the one who grafts us into your family. Even if I don't deserve it, because I know I don't. Deep down, I know I don't. Because I'm not perfect, and you are. And so how in the world am I going to be adopted into your family? I can't get there on my own. So how am I going to get there? How am I going to be a part of this family that seems so unreachable? Well, it's because of the Savior that died for me. And so with that, in this quiet, quiet moment, if you know for a fact that you are part of the line or the family of the serpent, if you know for a fact that you are part of this spiritual family that's spiraling down because you are trying to do life on your own, you're trying to get to heaven on your own, let me encourage you today that you can stop. And you can stop all of that you can trust in Jesus right here, right now. And it's so, so easy. But it's also life-changing. It's the easiest thing to say, but sometimes the hardest thing to do. Lord, here is what I need to say to you. If you need to make this decision today, Lord, I am sorry for my sins. I am sorry for straying into this family of the serpent that doubts you, that, that doesn't trust in you. And Lord, I ask that, won't you adopt me? And the only way I know that to be true the only way that can happen is that I trust in you. I trust in the fact that you sent your son, Jesus, to come to earth, to live a perfect life, to die, to take my sins upon himself, but then to proclaim victory over that sin and proclaim victory over death three days later. And because of that, I now have the opportunity to spend eternity with you because I believe in you as Savior and as Lord. And if that's you this morning, all I want you to do this morning is just to raise your hand. That's it. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, let us bask in the glory of the one and only Heavenly Father that has adopted you and I into his family. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of years 
and there's a lot of weird names and genealogies, but the greatest part is that I am part of the family of God because of Jesus and only because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and all that you do. In your name, I pray. Amen.